on the matter of who was the author of the Pentateuch. Objectors to Moses' authorship point to supposed differences in language and style and references to customs and cultures, <clears throat> which they maintain ruled Moses out in favor of a number of unknown authors. Henry Morris states in his book, The Genesis Record, Adherents of this odd idea have attempted to justify it on the basis of supposed peculiarities of language and style, <clears throat> references to customs and cultures, and other internal evidences, which seem to them to warrant this patchwork approach to the study of the book's compilation. Excerpt from Genesis chapter 1 study. Differences in style between Genesis chapters 1 and 2 demand neither different authors nor conflicting accounts, nor the conclusion that the Bible is not reliable. Critics of God's Word advance their, their own criticism of the Bible by making the grand assumption, with no substantive evidence, that there were a number of writers, compilers of the book of Genesis, who did not intend to make sense with what they arrived at, despite contradictions which the critics allege are evident. So the critics claim that the writers, compilers, circulated their work without any effort to reconcile anything. The critics maintain that this permitted what the critics view as irreconcilable contradictions, especially throughout Genesis chapters 1 and 2. <clears throat> and these alleged irreconcilable contradictions could then be used to openly refute God's word without any viable defense whatsoever. <clears throat> However, this alleged problem with the Bible's reliability is resolved with an honest, objective reading of Genesis chapters 1 and 2, strictly in accordance with the normative rules of language, context, and logic, which you can get what that is clearly defined as here, or just recall your own schooling and how you learn how to read. There's no change there. For an honest reading of God's Word reveals a wholly reliable, consistent meaning that completely upholds itself as reliable internally and externally without contradiction, error, or loose ends. And all the while, an honest reading of God's word completely refutes what the critics have continually claimed against the Bible, such as what they assert Genesis chapters 1 and 2 convey that is contradictory. When you read it properly, there is no contradiction. So the problem lies not with the words of God's word, but with how the critics or anyone interprets those words. The context of Genesis chapter 1 is panoramic and broad. context of Genesis chapter 2 is a close-up view of a person in a particular time frame, which was presented in Genesis chapter 1, namely the sixth day of creation, and the man whom Jehovah God created, Adam. And this view includes minutiae detail, such as the names and locations of four river tributaries and a specific garden which God planted and then placed into it the man he had formed. The man, the fact that Ada, Adam, needed a mate. The naming of specific animals and birds. The critics incorrectly assume that both chapters attempt to present the same events but use different styles to do this. I can do this myself and I'm one person. The critics claim that the style of chapter 1 is stereotyped, measured and precise with recurring formulae such as the repetitive use of the verb to create, is correct. This is because the subject matter and perspective of chapter 1 is more stereotype, measured, and precise, with recurring formulae, such as the repetitive use of the verb to create. Congratulations, you've interpreted that properly. It's not a contradiction, it's a different style of writing according to the context. It's all about context. And since chapter 2's subject matter and focus is more diversified and picturesque, a more diversified picturesque style without recurring formulae would be the most appropriate style for Moses to use. Another writer would not be needed to write chapter 2 because of the different style. God just simply inspired Moses to utilize the appropriate style to correspond to changes in the context. Anybody who writes anything of any value can change the tone of the context of the writing depending upon to whom they're talking about or the, the, the subject matter. Most accomplished writers do this today when the context dictate, dictates it. Refer to a local newspaper, a favorite novel, 
even a history book. On the other hand, many of the other claims of the critics, such as Chapter 2 is notably fresher, more spontaneous and primitive as compared to Chapter 1, are imaginary. Only in one's imagination could a claim be substantiated that Chapter 1 is not spontaneous or fresh or primitive. What could be more spontaneous, primitive, and fresh than Chapter 1 of Genesis Chapter 1, which begins, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. The style differences have no weight as an argument and simply reflect changes in subject matter. Point two, critics claim that anthropomorphic references to God described as exemplifying human behaviorisms in Genesis chapter 2, who fashions, breathes, plants, takes, sets, brings, closes up, builds, walks, contradicts the God of Genesis chapter 1. But the critics have quite a superficial argument here to, as well. Man in his finite mind cannot express ideas about God in anything but through anthropomorphic terms, anthropomorphisms. Furthermore, chapter 1 of Genesis also expresses God in such equally anthropomorphic terms as called, saw, blessed, deliberated. Genesis verse 26, let us make. God worked for six days, when he, then he rested. Point three, <clears throat> chapter two's lack of reference, of a reference to man being created in the image of God, contradicts chapter one, they maintain. But the critics assume beforehand that chapters one and two are two separate accounts of the overall creation process which someone attempted to hook together. They ignore the simplest and most obvious interpretation that chapter 2 is just a continuation of chapter 1 by the same author, providing more detail in a narrower and more focused area of what chapter 1 has already presented, from a panoramic to a close-up and detailed report and account. Has anybody watched a movie? Sometimes it pans in the camera. Sometimes it goes out to a wide panorama. The narrower and close focus often demands a change in verb tenses in person and more details, but without having to replicate details covered. A change of authors is not needed to be made to do this. If this is the case, and it is, that only one author is the author of this book, then chapter 2 being a continuation of what was already stated in chapter 1 does not need to repeat what was just stated in chapter 1 relative to such things like man being created in the image of God. The names for God differing between chapters 1 and 2 beginning at Genesis 2, 4b indicate a, cha a context change, not a contradiction or a change in authors, as some contend. The name change signifies and corroborates the beginning of chapter 2 to be at Genesis 2, 4b. Recall that the chapters and verse numbers were added later, not by the authors not by the author of this Pentateuch. So Genesis 2, 4a, the Holman standard, these are the accounts of the heavens and the earth when they were created. And then it jumps to Holman's 2, 4b, in the day that the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, made earth and the heavens. So here, God is referred to in Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 4a. In other words, throughout chapter 1, as Elohim rendered God, and as Elohim Yahweh rendered Lord God or Jehovah God, beginning from Genesis 2 4b on throughout Genesis chapter 2. Its presence in 2 4b signifies and corroborates the beginning of chapter 2 at, the, at that point. This compound name for God, Elohim Yahweh, combines the most sacred, holy, and personal name for God, Yahweh, with Elohim the absolute sovereign creator God, who was involved <clears throat> in every minute detail of his creation, a creation which he had in chapter 1 repeatedly stated as good and very good. It is clear that Moses, author Moses, Matthew 19 and John 7, changed from a focus upon the sovereign God who created the heavens and the earth in a panoramic and distant view in chapter 1, to a close-up of his relationship with that creation, and especially with Adam. 
And he did this in chapter 2, beginning with the designation, Genesis chapter 2, verse 4b. It is a legitimate and common literary practice for an author to utilize terms and names which reflect a different point of view to a previous context he has written. For example, a man might address a woman by her formal name at first, and then after a while begin to call her by a nickname, indicating that a friendship had been established. This may then evolve into a close, intimate husband and wife relationship, wherein endearments are used to address one another. You don't need three authors to do these three things. When Moses was inspired by God to write the Hebrew word Elohim throughout chapter 1, this established that there was one sovereign, almighty creator God, who, all by himself, <clears throat> created the heavens and the earth. Then, when the focus was to be narrowed, to provide more detail, especially on man himself, God inspired Moses to use the compound name for God, Yahweh Elohim, which conveys an almighty, sovereign creator, Elohim, God, creator God, Elohim, who, as Yahweh, is involved in every detail of his universe in a close personal relationship with it, especially with man. Doesn't need two authors. Later on, when the account begins to settle in on one on man himself, chapter 4, Moses was inspired by God to use the term Yahweh alone in order to emphasize God's holiness as well as his personal involvement with mankind. <clears throat> so Henry Morris states, in this section, chapter 2, the most distinctive vocabulary difference is the use of the divine name Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, instead of God Elohim, chapter 1. In Genesis 4, however, Lord the Lord, the word Lord, rendered from Yahweh, is used almost exclusively. The name God occurs in 425. The different names for God were used in order to portray the absolute sovereignty of God in creating the heavens and the earth, chapter 1, Elohim, the ongoing detail that a personal Yahweh, yet almighty God, was involved with in his creation, chapter 2, Yahweh, or the Elohim, and the personal involvement that Yahweh maintained in an ongoing manner with his creation, especially man. And so it's Yahweh. Objectors allege that there is no intended transition and continuation between chapters 1 and 2, that is, the irreconcilable work of two different authors. But there is, is a clear transition and a clear cont continuity between Genesis chapters 1 and 2, the consistent, non-contradictory work of one author. Look at this in... Genesis 2, 1 to 3, as well as Genesis 2, 4a, examined below. These passages actually conclude chapter 1. Verses 1 and 2 stipulate the completion of God's creation work by the seventh day. Verse 3 blesses that seventh day and sanctifies it to commemorate the secession of his creation work. Remember, the authors did not insert these verses and chapter headings. They're not the original. So, we have Genesis 2.1. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them are finished in perfect tense. And God completed by the seventh day his work, which he had made, and rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made, literally to make. So Genesis 2.1-3 and Genesis 2.4a are the conclusion of Genesis chapter 1. Note that verse numbers are not part of the original text, and but a later edition beginning at the third, 13th century for convenience sake, and they have not always been correctly configured, as is in the case here in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. Genesis 2, 1. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them are finished in perfect tense. Stipulates the completion of Elohim's work delineated in Genesis chapter 1 of the creation of the heavens and the earth and the host of them. The last phrase referring to heavenly bodies, especially the stars. Genesis 2, 2, And God completed by the seventh day his work which he had made and rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made, refers to Elohim, having completed his work of creating the heavens, the earth, and all the heavenly bodies. By the seventh day, in the sense that his work was finished through the sixth day and he rested, ceased his creative work on the seventh day. Hence, there were created no other universes, no more parts of the one universe, as some contend. On the other hand, this is not to say that God ceased working, but the context that follows throughout Scripture indicate that God gave himself 
to a new work of upholding his creation. 